For Kruma Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is anti-apartheid activist Steve Murray to discuss his book titled The True Confessions of an Unrehabilitated Terrorist. Can you briefly tell our viewers about your early life and how you were politicized? Well, um, I was born in 1956 in Stellenbosch. And I went to school there from sub A up until matric. And I think my politicization began during my schooling. It was going to visit my friends on the farms and the brutality with which the colored laborers were being treated, so-called colored laborers, um, by the white farmers, the, the parents of the children, you know? Mm. Kids being beaten for picking apples on their way home from school and things like that. And just uh, the apartheid in Stellenbosch mm. generally kind of woke me up to the cruelty of apartheid, the wrongness of it, and after I matriculated in 1974, I went very briefly to the army. Every white man was supposed to report for duty. But um, a year before that, I'd had a car accident. And um, I had letters from plastic surgeons saying I still needed some plastic surgery done to my eyelid. I wasn't fit for medical service. So that, that week that I spent in the army going in the troop train up here to Furteka Wachta and then they're giving me a temporary medical exemption for six months. They said, go back, have your operation, come back in June, July. And that's, that week that I was in the army was a real eye-opener for me. And I said, I'm never ever coming back to this place again. Mm -hmm. So I managed to go to university instead, to University of Cape Town. And then, of course, 76 happened, which was a big political eye-opener for everybody. So when it came to going to the army, I refused to go to the army. And instead, I went to Lesotho. And I lived there for a year in a village in Lesotho. I believe you were writing stories from this book about your life encounters on Facebook. And a lot of your followers kept on saying they wanted a book and you finally gave in. How did the idea of the book came about and how do you feel now that you have a book? Well, I feel very, very excited about having a book. When they first told me the book had been printed and it's on, it was on its way, I just couldn't wait. I was so excited about it. Mm. But I mean, basically in about 2015, I started writing little short anecdotes on Facebook like the first time my Deba visited us after he was released from prison, but we were still in prison. And it was only about two weeks after he was released. So I wrote a little short story about that. And then the day I was recruited into the ANC in 1983 in Maseru, in Lesotho, I wrote a little story about that. And I quite enjoyed writing them. They, most of them weren't more than like half a page or a page or so and so. And I started getting such encouraging feedback from people. Um, so people kept on saying, where's the book, where's the book, you must write a book. Uh, you know, it's nice reading these things little bit by little bit, mm -hmm. but please you must make, put it into a book. Mm -hmm. So when COVID came around, we ran out of work basically, we didn't have much work to do. And so I decided, well, let me try and put it all together in a book. Mm. And before I knew it, I had uh, quite a lot of stories strung together. And I filled in all the gaps on that until I was happy enough for it to be published. And I went to a couple of publishing houses. I won't mention any names, but I got turned down by three. And one of them, the South African History Online, run by Omar Bacha, um, he agreed to have it printed. And so I had some friends who agreed to edit it for me free of charge. Um, but that was towards the end of last year when I was seriously sick with a cancer. Um, and I had a brain tumor that was 
putting pressure on my brain and I was passing out and very, very confused. Mm. So all that negotiating about the book happened while I was lying in bed in hospital. But luckily I had good friends and comrades who could uh, do that for me. So Mr. Mare, the book is dedicated to Motale Selo, who in 1986 was killed in a shootout uh, with the police. And we know that his remains were, were later uncovered by the NPA's missing task team. Tell us about the relationship you had with him. I met Mutlale Khotso through my handlers in my serial Lesotho, ANC handlers. Mm -hmm. I, I got recruited into the ANC in Lesotho in 1983. And as often as I possibly could, I used to go to Lesotho, to Maseru, get debriefed by them. And Silo was one of the people who, especially towards the end, he was quite a regular visitor at um, is this Sandy, Sandy Jacobson and Winston Harper. I think the MK names were Millie and uh, Henry, Henry Kumalo, I think. Mm -hmm. So it was through them that I got to know Sil Law. On weekends when I used to go through to Maseru for debriefing. And uh, we just became quite close in a way. I didn't even know where he came from. I, he led me to believe that he was from Cape Town somewhere. And <coughs> we, never, we never spoke too much about each other's past. This was against the rules, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I came quite close to him, and I actually really loved him. He had a most beautiful smile. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in John Foster Square, um, one night, this Captain von Nicker came barging into my cell and he threw these photographs down on the mat where I was lying and he said, you see what we do to your terrorist friends? Um, it is in the book there, that's that story. And there were three or four photographs of people shot up lying on the ground by the side of the road and there was one of a man with half the face blown off. And I recognize him as Mutlala Khotso, mm -hmm. but I tried, I tried not to show it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard subsequently, uh, in fact, I think after I was released in 1990, that he'd been killed in a roadblock. Um, and, they, and they buried him as a pauper, as a in an unmarked grave somewhere near Mahikeng, yeah. And uh, so the security police, this guy, Captain Faniker, he knew who Mutlale Khotso was. Otherwise, he wouldn't have put the connection to me and Winston and Lesotho and all that and come in and showed me these blown up photographs. And yet, he was buried as an, in an unmarked grave. And it was only thanks to Madeleine Fallard and the National Prosecute, what is it called? And uh, prosecuting authority. Yeah, they have the missing task team, I apologize, mm. yeah. Mm. That they managed 20 years later in 2006 mm. to unleg and identify his bones. Mm. So it was like 30 years after the incident in 1986 that finally his parents had some closure. Mm. So I thought he would just be a good person to dedicate the book to. And I'm hoping at some stage soon I can <coughs> get hold of his family near to Mount Fletcher and then I can give them a copy of the book. Once I'm well enough to travel far enough, I want to do that. And why are you calling yourself an unrehabilitated terrorist? <laughs> oh, it's a difficult one. It's, it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek um, and it's a little bit contradictory as well because um, at the end of the book I say, I try to give a definition of terrorism. And if I stick to that definition, I'm definitely not a terrorist. But I, I had this, I've got this friend, um, everyone knows him as Blah. Um, he was also in MK, he was also with um, Winston and them in, in Botswana. But when he came back from exile, he integrated into the army 
and I got to know him very closely. And he always said to me, Yeah, you unrehabilitated terrorist, you. <laughs> no, that's where the name comes from, really, you know. It's just a little bit. I've, I've ummed and awed about it. Some people think it might be a bit uh, contentious as a name. But anyway, um, so far no one has strongly objected to it. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning of the book, you tell us that you, you had a dream. Uh, you were in your deathbed, but then you woke up. And now you had another dream that you were dreaming of the country to have a, an abundance of, you mentioned a few things, fresh air, food, clean water, uh, loving and supporting communities, just to mention a few. But are you still hopeful that uh, your dream will come true one day? <laughs> One day, yes. Maybe not in my lifetime, but yeah, one has to live in hope. Your sense of humor comes through when you share uh, some of the stories. And one story that I would love for you to briefly share with our viewers is for when you visited uh, fellow comrades who were in prison. Uh, you brought them an, an orange liquid fruit that was spiked with uh, vodka. Can you briefly share that story? Yes. Um, this was after I was released from prison, eh? Mm. Um, Ketua can bear me out. I think it was 90... 1990. Mm. But um, there were these comrades who'd been sent to death row. Our uh, Ting Ting, Jabu Muluketi, Jabu Masina, Neo Putsana, that's yeah. right. And I forget the fourth one. But anyway, um, you know, after the negotiations and the unbanning and all of it, they were removed from death row mm. and sent to Sun City, Johannesburg Prison, Deep Cliff. Deep Cliff. Um, I don't know why, but anyway, they moved off death row to there. Mm -hmm. Why they were released, I don't know. Maybe it was somebody negotiating with him. But we had a friend, Cara, who, she wasn't a medical doctor, but she was a, a health practitioner. And she had these big long syringes, and you know, with a, a liquid fruit, you've got those top little flaps. So the one little flap you could open, mm. and then you could inject into it. So we pour, we sucked out some of the orange juice, and we put vodka, <laughs> vodka in, and sealed it back up again. So I think there were four or six little liquid fruits um, with substantial amount of vodka in it. And we managed to get that in without the waters being able to smell anything. And by the end of our, our visit to them, all of the liquid fruits had been finished. So everybody was like rolling and having a really good time. And I think, imagine going from being a death row prisoner, mm. uncertain, are you going to live or are you going to die, to being able to have a little Tipple is a celebration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, w which story would you say um, received a lot of attention? Maybe the one about some of my best friends or Christians. Um, it's, a, it's also a little bit tongue in cheek, but I was just trying to explain to people why, personally, I'm not a Christian, you know, mm. and trying to understand why so many people in South Africa are Christians. So, it was also meant to be a little bit funny, but uh, I've got a lot of reaction to it. Okay. We are meeting you on a day that is, uh, is used to remember our former statesman, Nelson Mandela. Do you have any memories that you would like to share with us? Sure. I, I only met him that one time, mm -hmm. and that was in prison. And we didn't know he was coming. Mm -hmm. But that morning, the prison warder came to us and he said, you must put on your best prison uniform because you're getting a very important visitor this morning. And uh, we could kind of put two and two, but we didn't quite believe it, you know. And then we were taken through to the doctor's come visitor's room, small little room. And there, lo and behold, there was this mighty man standing there in his real life. You know, I mean, we'd grown up. I'd, I'd, when I grew up in Stellenbosch, I'd never even heard of him. I'd kind of heard of Robben Island, but I didn't really know anything. Mm. So, yeah, it was this man, you know, we'd kind of followed in his footsteps and taken on the 
apartheid regime militarily, and there he was in real life. It was just, it was just too incredible, you know. Um, it was really amazing that he, you know, he took time out of his busy, busy schedule, two weeks into coming out of prison, and he said, no, he wants to go and visit the, the prisoners. And I think he did that with all the prisoners throughout the country, the female prisoners as well, you know. So hats off to him. There was Steve Murray in conversation with Polity discussing his book titled The True Confessions of an Unrehabilitated Terrorist.